Okay, we should begin. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today. For some of us, it's evening. For our presenters, it's the morning um, in Philippines. My name is Mari Margill with the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. The center works with partners at the local and national levels in different countries around the world. We work internationally to advance legal rights of nature and connecting that to the human right to a healthy environment as well as democratic rights as well. This is a part of our monthly webinar series in which we like to focus on developments from around the world within the framework of establishing legal rights of the natural world. And today we are excited because we're going to be hearing from leading advocates on the rights of nature in the Philippines. So before we begin and introduce our presenters for today, I wanted to share several announcements. The first is that on October 1st and 2nd, we are co-hosting the Global Forum on the Rights of Nature and the Human Right to a Healthy Environment. And that will be featuring speakers from different parts of the world as well as indigenous nations, including India, Bangladesh, Australia, New Zealand, and Ecuador. We're co-hosting the Global Forum with Dignity Rights International and the Global Environmental Rights Institute, both at the Widener University Delaware Law School in the United States. The registration for the Global Forum is open, it's free, and we hope you can join us. And we're going to be um, putting up some information about how to register. You can find that information on our website homepage, the Center for Environmental Rights.org, just Center for Environmental Rights.org. You can also find other information there, of course, about the organization, how to contact us, joining our newsletter, and so on. And we'll include that information in the chat box here um, within the webinar. So just a few notes, um, some housekeeping, if you will. During the presentation, everyone um, who is attending is welcome to submit questions in the question and answer box um, here on Zoom. Um, and following the presentation from our two speakers, we'll have time to ask some questions of our presenters and hear their responses. During the webinar, everyone's microphone, but the presenters will be muted. And this webinar is being recorded, so we will be able to make it available online soon after we finish. Um, and then you can share it and we can send it out to everyone. Um, and so that is it for details. Um, and now I want to jump right in and introduce our two speakers from the Philippines who are joining us today. We are welcoming Yolanda Esguera. She's the National Coordinator of PMPI. That's the organization, the Partnership Mission for People's Initiatives, previously called the Philippine Miserable Partnership. PMPI is a social development and advocacy network composed of more than 250 non-governmental organizations, church faith-based groups, and people's organizations. Yolanda is a longtime advocate and activist in college. She pushed for changes in Philippine society, and in particular for reforms in the Philippine educational system. As president of the St. Joseph's College Student Council, and as Secretary General of the National Union of Students in the Philippines. She later advocated for peace and justice, supporting the causes of the most vulnerable in Philippine society, including workers, peasants, and the urban poor. And she did that with the Ecumenical Forum for Church Response and People's Enlightenment Power for Enlightenment and Commitment to Sovereignty and Truth, Pentecost. Today, she is the coordinator, national coordinator of PMPI, advocating for social justice and human rights, and which has now expanded to include environmental advocacy and the recognition of the rights of nature. And she's helping to steer the national campaign in the Philippines on the rights of nature, which is being led by PMPI and the National Secretariat for Social Action, Caritas Philippines, which is the humanitarian development and advocacy arm of the Catholic Church there. Now, also, we have a second presenter. Yolanda worked very closely with him. He is attorney Mario Madarazzo, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. I know him better as attorney Mackey, who works with PMPI, um, as well in involving himself in the rights of nature legislation drafting for the organization. Now, as a lawyer, attorney Mackey has worked on numerous environmental and social justice issues. This includes working with PMPI on anti-mining issues, 
as well as working with organizations such as Greenpeace and Conservation International in the Philippines to strengthen marine protected areas and protect key marine biodiversity. He also works on human rights issues for the organization Ideals, providing quick response legal services for victims and families of human rights violations in the context of the drug war of the government and strategic litigation of cases. So we have two very strong activists with us on environmental and social justice issues who have long track records in this area. And I'm really, really pleased to have them with us today. And we also just wanted to let everyone know that today's webinar is also taking place as part of the celebration of the season of creation that PMPI is involved with. And it's also part of the series of webinars sponsored by the Global Catholic Climate Movement, Filipinas, which PMPI is a convener of, and which is taking place through the month of September and through October 11th. So a very important time in Philippines and for this work. So I'm going to ask you all to join me in welcoming Yolanda Esguera, and then we'll hear from Attorney Mackey. So Yolanda, take us away. Okay, uh, good morning or good evening uh, to all. Mm. Do you see it, my, my slide now? Yes, okay. that's perfect. Okay. okay, the work to push for the recognition of the rights of nat nature globally has become more urgent and meaningful at this time on two counts. Mm -hmm. It's not moving. Uh, wait, uh, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so on two counts, one, the health pandemic, which the world scientists believe was caused by humanity's over intrusion and destruction of our biodiversity, forest and the wilds, and two, the continuing threats of climate change and its projected impact to the human species, agreed by more than 11,000 scientists and from 150 53 countries as possibly fatal to humankind if not reversed. It is in this context that the work to protect our environment and the push for the recognition of the rights of nature becomes even more urgent and pressing. To focus on the Philippines, we are a country of more than 7,000 islands. Geographically, we are a small country but very rich in natural resources. We have a long marine coastline, the land is fertile, and our climate is temperate to subtropical, providing conducive environment for many plants and animal species to thrive. The Philippines is also considered as among the most biodiverse countries of the world, and uh, having two-thirds of the Earth's biodiversity, between 70 to 80 percent of the world's plant and animal species. Also, we are considered as the most as among the most mineralized country in the world. Uh, we have gold, copper, nickel, and uh, chromite. And of course, we are rich in human resources. You no, know? we are all over the world working. Actually, uh, we have a population of 109 million people and rank as 13 most populous nation in the world. Sadly though, our country, our country's natural resources are being plundered by big corporations, local and international, corrupt government officials, and enabled by a set of laws and policies partial to this elite and privileged few. In particular, we take note of the big role of the companies, no, uh, of the companies uh, and corporation involved in extractive industries, no? 
in mega construction and infrastructures that massively destroys the environment and earns millions of profits more than benefiting and addressing the needs of our people. Aside from this reality, our country also faces great threats from the impacts of global warming. In 2018, the Philippines was ranked first in the Global Risk Index as the most vulnerable country on the impacts of climate change. And even though we boast of uh, many good environmental laws, they are not effectively implemented. And obviously, camp communities have no match to how corporations and corrupt officials circumvent the laws to their own benefit. And true that the Philippines has a robust and strong civil society movement on human rights and environmental protections, but they are often challenged, repressed, and harassed by corporate and state-sponsored police and military machineries. This human rights, thus human rights violations abound in our country, and the Philippines is consistently ranked as highest among the countries in Asia where cases of killings of environmental defenders, particularly in the extractive or mining sector, are happening. With this prevailing situation, the demands to protect the environment is ever growing and ever greater and has become even more urgent for us. So how did the Rights of Nature, Rights of Nature campaign start? The RON campaign, so I call it RON, the RON campaign was born from this several decades of environmental protection advocacies by both PMPI and CBC PNASA. PMPI uh, has long been supporting communities in their struggle against mining, and it is our flagship project since 2005. The campaign has given us small victories, but little dent was generated to stop mining companies from destroying not only natural communities, but also human communities as they created divisions among the people and have uprooted them from their homes and culture. In 2014, being a social development network of more than 250 members, PMPI launched a campaign to explore and advance a more holistic development paradigm away from the current capitalist and or neoliberal development perspective and in search for a more homegrown and people-oriented development. It is in this search that PMPI encountered the Pachamama Alliance Symposium on Awakening the Dreamer, Changing the Dream in 2016. Father John Laydon, a Columban priest working in the Philippines, as launch advocate for the environment, introduced us to this symposium. The symposium gave us a more holistic perspective of the world, its development, and what could, what could be possible. Since then, uh, the, the passion is to understand and operationalize this holistic and alternative framework, which led to our encounter with many literatures on the rights of nature. And from then on, there was no more stopping us from generating and germinating the idea on RON within the PMPI network and in the Philippines. In June 2018, we launched the Rights of Nature campaign in the country through a national caravan and march, traversing lands and seas from north to south of the Philippines. And it was an insightful journey, meeting communities, engaging in dialogue, and interacting with people along the way and during the trips, and highlighting the call to recognize the rights of nature and our anti-mining calls. And it was at this point that while we are having Salakyag, that Marie, uh, I received an email from Marie Margil. Uh, I was on a boat actually uh, traveling and uh, I received that email and Marie took interest in our work and offered support. And that started the partnership with uh, then CELBF and now with Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. Since this launching, 
uh, many activities have been done and many objectives have been uh, pursued. In a sense, the campaign, that's Marie. <laughs> So we have invited Marie in many of our uh, forum uh, during the many activities and uh, uh, help us also in in the, in in the crafting of the, the 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 law. In a sense, the campaign is heavily slanted on the social cultural perspective, changing the social social cultural perspective with a strong push towards the transformation of the political and legal system in the Philippines, calling for a paradigm shift in the way we appreciate and relate to its nature. Just like many Ron advocates in the world, we believe that the whole economic, political, and sociocultural system is flawed because it views human person as the most important species and therefore subsumes the interests of all other creatures for our own self-interest. The system is anthropocentric and hierarchic and ultimately utilitarian because it values nature based on its usefulness to human and regards the environment as a product, a property, or something that can be used infinitely. This modern worldview has disconnected us from our relationship with nature and resulted to massive use or abuse of our natural resources beyond its caring capacity. The Rights of Nature campaign, therefore, in the Philippines pushes for a paradigm shift towards a more connected, interdependent, respectful, and just relationship with nature. To recognize that nature has the right to exist, flourish, and thrive like human beings, and that this is essential in creating a world where all of creation can live sufficiently and harmoniously with and for each other. The humans are not only stewards. Nature has been a steward to us since time beginning. With this context and uh, perspective on the rights of nature, what have we been doing? There are six tracks. These are major uh, direction of the rights of nature campaign in the Philippines. One is the education and information campaign in schools, churches, local communities, and the public highlighting and introducing the consciousness that we are nature human and nature came from the same source and coming from the same source and universe then all living beings in the world should have rights just like human beings and to promote the shift in awareness we draw inspiration and basis and support from the following our faith perspective, the genesis or creation clearly showing that God made humans last. We were formed from the womb of Mother Earth, from the elements of water, soil, and air. From dust, we return to dust. This story also highlights the stewardship mandate of people to be carer, not their own masters. Second, we derive basis from the evolution, evolutionary theory that humans evolved and came from a single cell organism and we were born and developed or evolved during the age of the Xenozoic era or the mammalian stage. Therefore, many other creatures preceded us and they can in fact scientifically outlive us. Third, the indigenous people's cosmology and interconnectedness and the traditional religions like Buddhism, both spousing a consciousness that highly respects, reveres, and offers generosity to other creation. Fourth, the philosophical exposition of Thomas Berry provided a basis to define where does rights originate? 
that rights originate where there is existence. So if one exists, therefore one has rights. Further, Berry said that every creature that exists has a specific role and functions to play in the whole circle of life. And therefore, any action impeding these roles and function violate the creature's rights. And last but not least, we draw inspiration from the Papal Encyclical Laudato Si. Nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or, or as a mere setting in which we live. We are nature, included thus, we are included and in constant interaction uh, with it. So Laudato Si provides great inspiration to us to push for the protection of our common home, to hear the cry of the poor and the cry of Mother Earth. It redefines a new understanding of social justice, that justice is for all creation and not only for human beings. In our effort to educate and inform schools and uh, uh, churches and public, we note a milestone in our campaign. The, our key uh, church leaders of the Catholic Bishop Conference of the Philippines in their pastoral letter titled Urgent Call for Ecological Conversion, Hope in the Face of Climate Emergency, calls to embrace the rights of nature perspective and to support the bill we filed in Congress. This is now paving the way for, um, for more churches and people to support the campaign. Last year also, we note that we were able to develop and organize a bigger network called Rights of Nature PH, where more than 50 uh, civil society organizations and NGOs have embraced the campaign on the rights of nature. Second strategy and direction or track is our Sapat Lifestyle Campaign. Sapat Lifestyle Campaign. Uh, it is a call for a shift in behavior and personal commitment to a way of living that is more sustainable, sufficient, uh, healthy, and where all the basic needs of people are for fulfilled. It encourages activities that promotes interaction between human and nature, uh, like practice like low carbon lifestyle, practice of waste segregation, recycling, anti single use of plastic, or a simple planting, tree planting, cleaning the ocean shores, backyard gardening, advocating for green spaces and park. It does push us for a community where all the rights and needs of all creation are fulfilled, where all creatures share a space in the community. Third track is lobbying for eco-governance. We, we here we hold dialogue with local government uh, units, which have in environmental issues and introduce to them the rights-based approach to development with the rights of nature lands to their local development plans. Dialogues with relevant government agencies with mandate on environment and agriculture and services to vulnerable sectors are also being done to introduce the rights of nature perspective. Fourth and also among the most important is the lobby for a new legal framework or making ecosystem as a rights-based uh, entity. We are pushing the passage of a national law or the rights of nature. We have filed a bill in both chambers of Philippine Congress and from two champion lawmakers last year, we now have three legislators who co-authored the bill and two more who promised to become authors. So in total, seven lawmakers solidly on our side now. We are also piloting and drafting the development and passage of local community level ordinances and resolution in this regard. Attorney Maki will be able to discuss this strategy in detail uh, later. Number five is engaging corporations uh, and companies. This is done through our anti-mining campaign projects 
where we help communities uh, struggling against the negative impact, impact of mining. Since we started our campaign to protect communities from these mining operations, uh, we do and mount actions no, to challenge mining companies from holding dialogues to pickets of their offices to disrupting mining companies' activities and release information on their destructive activities. In fact, as a result, PMPI in 2015 uh, was, uh, has been charged with a libel case filed by a mining company, Hinatuan Mining Company, a subsidiary of Nickel Asia. The case is still uh, ongoing. Last, empowering communities and ind indigenous peoples. Since the communities will be the primary stewards and will serve as representatives in courts if an ecosystem shall file a suit to protect its rights, educating and organizing communities is a must. From the IPs, we have a lot to learn in terms of their rootedness in nature. Thus, to codify their customary and indigenous law and making it recognizable in and enforceable in secular justice system setting can signal protection, better protection for the environment and the, the recognition of their rights. But the campaign is not without challenge. Explaining the difference between mainstream and environmental protection perspective at the rights of nature is a great challenge. Many of our community partners have been protecting their environment for decades with a very human-centered uh, framework. Second, some seasoned environmental advocates are also unable to appreciate it. Many uh, look at it with suspicion and sometimes sarcasm. Three, the political context where big business and oligarchies are strong in the Philippines and who are also our lawmakers and key leaders that controls institution of governance. Four, constricting democratic space and rising human rights violation in the country under President Duterte's authoritarian regime. And five, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has prevented us from traveling places and reaching out to people and communities who have no access to tools, skills, and money for an online encounter like this. All these challenges confronts us, but we just have to remember our small victories so as not to waver in our commitment. And uh, with the help of the communities, partners, and people who have long been struggling to protect the environment and the human community so that all may live and thrive in one common home. With God's guidance and omnipotent presence, we believe that we will overcome whatever obstacles that will come our way. We believe that we are moving forward. We believe that the rights of nature movement, our movement worldwide, shall succeed and the good news shall be proclaimed in the end so help us god and thank you for listening yolanda thank you so much that was so powerful and we very much appreciate your work your leadership on this and i know that attorney mackie is going to now present to all of us um, and get into a bit more detail about the legislation um, that they've been working on and had introduced into the Filipino Congress. Attorney Mackey, thank you for joining us now. Okay, uh, can you see my slide now? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, Yoli already mentioned about the uh, legis the legislation that uh, is being uh, lobbied by the PMPI and of course CBC CBC Pinasa in this regard. Uh, for a while, it's not moving. 
sorry. Okay, so uh, uh, to to go uh, to the topic of the national legislation, because I'll be discussing the national legislation and briefly on the local proposed local legislation, as uh, Yoli mentioned. So uh, I think Yoli has uh, expounded on the basis of uh, the work that we do and with the, the basis of this uh, national proposed national legislation that we are pushing for is essentially to recognize that nature have legal rights. And so far, we have two bills in Congress that is being filed, one at the Senate. It's entitled Senate Bill 1097, an act recognizing the rights of nature ecosystem, populations and process, and providing mechanism for the protection and enforcement thereof, or Rights of Nature Act of 2019. And then it's, it has a counterpart bill at the lower house, an act to promote the rights of nature in the Philippines or the Rights of Nature Act. And both actually, uh, th this bill was uh, developed by PMPI by, by uh, undergoing a lot of uh, consultation and workshop uh, with uh, different sectors and even the scientists and lawyers, the legal groups, so as to determine how we can frame this uh, uh, proposed legislation. And most of the declaration of policy that is included here it's basically a, uh, a statement of the recognition to uh, to recognize the rights of nature and to give it uh, a uh, to give it a uh, legal personality and uh, imb imbued with rights that can be uh, enforceable in courts. And so it's good that uh, with the help also of Mary and her organization, we're able to develop and craft this bill. And uh, even the rights that we have put in the in the bill are based on the inputs also of, of, of Mary and her organization. And also, this was also based, as I said, on the consultation uh, with the different sectors, notably with the indigenous communities. So some of the rights included uh, the rights of... Uh, interconnectedness, harmony, collective good, multiculturalism, coexistence with human rights, and promotion of ecologically, ecologically sound technologies. So here, there is a, there both of the bills also provide for the fundamental rights of nature, uh, the right to exist, the right to, uh, uh, to function uh, its process ensure their sustainability among others so bo both bills both version in a way have the same provisions as to the fundamental rights of nature uh, and also in the same way that uh, it recognizes this fundamental rights that all human development that alters or modifies natural ecosystem population or processes must be sustainable. So here it it uh, imposes certain standard on how development, human development, should be done, and uh, which should ensure allow for renewal and restoration, respect for intra intergenerational equity. And then both both uh, versions also recog uh, ha has the same provision on the recognition of legal personality of natural system. And processes. So you will notice that the the unit of analysis here is the ecosystem. So because it's usually a question of during the consultation, what if we destroy, uh, we pluck a twig of a plant or uh, something like that. But we always deal with the rights of nature in terms of uh, ecosystem, its integrity and its relation within the uh, different processes within the ecosystem. And then the, both both bills also uh, defines uh, representation and standing. We know for a fact legally that to be able to file a case, you need to establish a your standing. And both bills recognize that uh, any any Filipino resident can file an action for and in behalf of the rights of nature uh, by protecting the natural ecosystem, population, or processes. 
So we're using the term natural ecosystem, population, or processes concerned, and, and that in a way will be the real party and interest. But of course, this will be filed through human agency by a, a, any Filipino resident. And in terms of relief, both bills uh, uh, also require that, uh, that any, any harm done or violation of the rights of nature as provided in, 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 the, in the proposed bill uh, would require the violator to pay damages, attorney's fees, and cost of suit. And, uh, and, they, and aside from that, they will also be liable for uh, other environmental laws that may have been violated aside from the violation of the rights of nature law. So we, we, here we see that the violation of the uh, environmental law is different with the violation, environmental law with respect to the rights of uh, people to healthy ecology, and it's separate from the violation to the rights of nature. And with respect to the damages that will be given by the court it, or awarded by the court in case the, the case prosper in court, the, the damages or the monetary award will be put in a trust fund. So both bills uh, have that provision. And that trust fund will be used to rehabilitate and uh, restore or preserve and, or protect as uh, depending on the order of the court and that money given by the court will be placed in a trust fund which will be managed by a committee. We call it the uh, conservation committee and this conservation committee, both, both uh, versions, uh, this is intended to manage the funds that will be given in, uh, or awarded to the, in case there is uh, damages uh, uh, given by the court and this uh, the members of this uh, conservation committee will be from the different sectors uh, within the jurisdiction or where the ecosystem is located so this is to ensure that uh, uh, various sectors even government and non-government will have participation in terms of ensuring that the uh, the conservation and protection of the rights of nature and uh, of course, both bills also provide for uh, procedural uh, rules that will be uh, followed uh, in uh, prosecuting or filing cases in relation to the protection of the rights of nature. And then this, uh, we have this uh, standard provision of strategic lawsuits and public participation. I suppose you're aware of this. In the Philippines, most of our environmental laws have this standard provision. And we have incorporated this in the in the versions of the Senate and the House, uh, which essentially says that uh, any vexatious or harassment suit can be dismissed and by a motion in court, because this is to ensure that people or groups or individual who are promoting or protecting the rights of nature will will not be harassed or vexed by litigation suits because these are very uh, it's, these are the usual things that happen here in the philippines like i think you only mentioned about the libel suit filed against a by a mining company so this uh, slap or strategic lawsuit and public participation will ensure will tap on the uh, volunteerism of people so they will not be afraid to really uh, play an active role in promoting the rights of nature and then both bills also provide for provisions on education. We know, and as Sholly mentioned also, it's important that there's a paradigm shift involved. So it's important that these ideas, the actions, and all these uh, uh, activities that needs to be promoted in relation to the protection of the rights of nature should be replicated through a formal system systematically, programmatically, so that both bills have put in provisions that it will be part of the curriculum uh, in the educational system. And then, of course, penalties are provided, a uh, maximum of 10 million. Both bills have the same provision, actually. And this is intended to, uh, as a penalty or punishment for violators of the, the bill, of the law, rather. 
Okay. And of course, it provides also uh, the Senate bill uh, provides specific uh, penalty for members of the government owned government owned or controlled corporation or offender. If the offender is a public official or employer, there's a specific provision on their penalties. Uh, yes, because in the Philippines, usually the, with the corruption, and usually these are the government uh, officials or employees who are also involved in the violation of environmental laws, and we want to ensure that uh, this is also incorporated in the proposed uh, law on rights of nature. So both bills have, have that provision also. And of course, the implementing rules and regulation to supply the details of uh, implementation. Both bills has provided an interagency that will draft the uh, implementing rules and regulation once the law is passed within 90 days from the time of its effectivity. And then also important is the appropriation because uh, this is to give teeth to the implementation of the law. So both bills also has that, have that uh, uh, provisions. Now, now we go to, so th those are the uh, salient features of the proposed bill on uh, rights of nature. Now briefly, I want to discuss the uh, rights of nature through local legislation. And the closest law or reference that we can have is the Local Government Code of 1991. And this provides for uh, the local autonomy of the local government units, namely the province, city, or municipality, or barangay. Barangay being the basic unit, political unit in the Philippines. And uh, rights of, right now, the PMPI is, uh, is on a discussion with a few uh, local officials because they are interested in uh, drafting a local legislation but we think this will require further technical study and we need to follow also the framework uh, of the proposed national legislation that it will be ecosystem based in that regard it will require uh, talking with local officials and members of the different uh, local government units and so that they will also understand and uh, appreciate the context on why we need to push for the rights of nature. But, uh, but so far with our dialogue with a few members of the local uh, councils of some uh, municipalities in the Philippines, they are very much interested in pushing for this uh, local legislation. But of course, it will take a while because as I've said, uh, require technical studies such as uh, establishing a baseline for the status of the of the uh, the different ecosystem found within a specific jurisdiction is needed so as uh, it will provide uh, the basis for uh, the proposal uh, for the uh, local legislation now i end my presentation with a quote from our modern day hero, Makli Indulag, is a leader of, the, of our indigenous people in the north. And he says, you ask if we own the land and mock us saying, where is your title? Such arrogance to speak of owning the land when we instead are owned by it. How can you own that which you outlives you? Uh, Makli Indulag. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Attorney Mackey. That was really Really excellent, thank you so much. Um, and so now I'd like to ask um, Yolanda to join us again in her video, if she can turn that on, because um, we have several questions from um, the attendees. One of the questions comes from Bob, and Yolanda, I believe you spoke a little bit about this, but I want to ask if you could expand on it. Um, particularly with regard to people who are um, living in poverty or are the most vulnerable populations in Philippines. Um, can you tell us how they interact with or are involved or related to the Rights of Nature campaign that you are working on? Yes. Um, the communities where we work, uh, mostly who are underprivileged and, and poor, uh, are actually into environmental protection prior to the Rights of Nature campaign already. 
uh, we see that they see the importance of protecting the environment and calling out corporations who are actually monopolizing the 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 use of the services of uh, the 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 environment. So the campaign is also a call uh, in a way to protect Mother Nature uh, for not for the benefit of the communities also and calling out the destructive uh, activities of mining companies. So uh, somehow uh, the, 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 the difficulty is actually explaining what's the difference of the rights of nature and the long time advocacy that they have been uh, doing. That's the, the, the only uh, difference. But as we dialogue and uh, discuss, they're able to understand what it means for nature to have rights. Thank you, that's very, that's very important. And I wanted to ask, both of you have mentioned, I believe, the COVID-19 pandemic, and I know that it has impacted Philippines um, in a very major way and continues to do so. Can you just help us understand um, with the national legislation which has been introduced into the Congress, um, is the Congress um, actively working now and what is the status in terms of moving the national legislation forward, particularly through the House? Yeah. I, I think I'll answer first. Now, I think at this time, we really have uh, a big challenge on that because the current administration is, or the, the legislators who are uh, affiliated with the, with the current government is more concerned with several legislation that is not what we needed at the moment. So we, in fact, we had this anti-terrorism law that was passed and now they're looking into because there's a forthcoming election and uh, they, they have this discussion about having a hybrid election or going back to the old system. So I think uh, it's, it's unfortunate, at least from my perspective, that the, the, this legislation has taken a backseat in terms of priorities. And given the fact that it, 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 it proposes a very unique and somehow revolutionary concept and it and because the concept itself would be against the interest of a lot of businessmen who are also in congress so we find it really uh there there's a big hurdle for us and this pandemic in terms of physically lobbying with the congressmen and legis other legislators uh, has proven to be a, a a real challenge for us and now I wanted to also ask Yolanda, one of the challenges that you identified um, at the end of your presentation was interacting with and perhaps allying with more conventional environmental mainstream organizations. I wonder if you could speak a little bit a bit more about that, about how you're building bridges or engaging with them and I would imagine the effort to try to bring them in to support the Rights of Nature campaign. Yes, um, we organized uh, a lot of uh, forum and uh, dialogue uh, with different uh, environmental groups at the moment. Uh, and also, uh, uh, as I've said, uh, education campaigns in, even in schools and uh, other institutions. So we wanted to, as much as possible, mainstream the understanding of the Rights of Nature campaign. And uh, in a way, uh, there are, of course, little victories because we are able to forge a partnership, as I've said, via a bigger network, which we call the Rights of Nature uh, PH, where more than 50 organizations uh, initially have already uh, extended support uh, into the Rights of Nature uh, campaign. So slowly, uh, we're moving no, into this dialogue and better understanding of the, the campaign of the Rights of Nature. Mm. Thank you so much for that. One of the aspects of your work, which I know has been really quite um, unusual in the rights of nature movement, 
globally has been the role of the church. Um, as you mentioned in your presentation, Yolanda, the Pope Francis has talked about the rights um, of the environment. The Church of Sweden has done a little, you know, taken some steps forward on rights of nature, but it really seems that the Catholic bishops of Philippines have been the most outspoken with their pastoral letter last year. And I wonder if you could elaborate on how the role of the church um, is helping to build this campaign in the Philippines, because we simply haven't seen that yet in other countries. Uh, the the CBC Pinasa uh, Caritas Filipinas, of course, is key uh, to the work of, uh, on the on the campaign. But as you see, the Philippines is uh, very much a Catholic country, and uh, the the voice of the church is very much important among the the faithful. So, uh, if the church is involved in the campaign, uh, they, we can reach as many citizens and believers uh, possible. So, for example, currently uh, in our in our uh, local legislation piloting, uh, we we talked with the bishop and the social action directors of uh of a region where the Sierra Madre mountain ranges are are located and uh together we are planning to push for a legislation uh declaring declaring the the Sierra Madre mountain ranges as having rights the bishop and the social action directors are very much affirmative in this respect because they wanted to preserve the, the this this ecosystem which is being threatened by uh, uh, construction of big dams in that uh, in that area so they pr they promised because they are able to connect uh, with the local governments because the church is, is there where the local government is also. They promised that in the forum where they are joined by the local government units, they will uh, discuss this framework, the rights of nature framework because they see it as very important in their, in their push to protect nature. So they ask for for um, materials, no. The bishop asked for for materials and uh, promised us that uh, they will bring this to the local government. So that's how the role of the church is. Aside from they can discuss and uh, from the pulpit, they are into the communities also. They are part of the communities. They have uh, basic Christian communities, for example, that regularly meets. And if we want a paradigm shift in the socio-cultural perspective, you know, uh, to 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 embrace this perspective, then the church has the structure to do it also. Yeah, it's a very powerful um, in shaping um, public ideas and public thoughts about the natural world. So I can see it as a very powerful. Um, step to have the church so involved in your campaign, both at the national and the local level. Um, I also wanted to ask a question that we have for Attorney Mackey. We wondered if you could speak a little bit more about your thoughts about how moving um, a local law forward under the Code of 1991, how that might um, relate to the national legislation and back and forth. Part of that question comes, there's different people um, who are participating on this call, this webinar, and different people that we work with in, in different parts of the world that um, are working at the local or the national level. And there can be some confusion about what is the best step to take. And you're looking to take both steps. And so I wondered if you could just speak a little bit more about that strategy. And if you see that working at both levels will help at those levels. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mary. I, I'll speak with my experience of lobbying for the fisheries code. 
Uh, so we started at the national, at the local level, there's this practice of man managing the coastal resources through a council, Fisheries Aquatic Resource Management Council. Then there were ordinances passed in this regard. And, uh, there, and then there's a separate uh, law that was lobbied for uh, a reform in fisheries. So we had this fisheries code, which became also a law. And what is interesting is that uh, this provision of locally managing the coastal resources were placed in the law. It started, in fact, as an executive order when the national government recognized that it's important that the community participates in the coastal management. So they, they passed an executive order on the Fisheries Aquatic Resource Management Council, and then it was uh, ingrained in the national law. So in that, you, you, it's like we call it bibinka approach because this this local food where to able to cook it you have far below and far up so to cook that uh, bibinka that rice cake so it's an approach that we call it here in the Philippines the bibinka approach and with the rights of nature we also hope to replicate that but of course there's a lot of challenges here. Although in the local government code of 1991, it recognizes the local autonomy of the local government units, but there is this uh, legal legal uh, challenge. I, I, I pose it as a legal challenge because in the national law, you have a you have a penalty which is higher, but if you do local legislation, you can, uh, there's a certain amount of penalty that you can impose, like for a barangay, you can only say 1,000 pesos, compared to a national law that you can impose 10 million pesos. Mm. So in that regard, because this experience, for instance, in fisheries, because I'm very familiar with that, there are a lot of ordinances, just to ilu illustrate my point, there are a lot of ordinances, local ordinances, mimicking the provisions of the national law, but the problem is it imposes a, uh, smaller penalties, shorter uh, term for imprisonment. And that, some, that at certain point, it provides opportunity for corruption because when a law enforcer catches a violator and then it becomes the, the law enforcer will say, uh, we'll file this in the local ordinance. So we'll have uh, the penalties is low, are lower. So these are the challenges that we need to consider. But in our last meeting, I think with the discussion of a barangay official, I mentioned that it's important for the local legislation to focus on incentivizing actions, programs, so that's in a way the local, local legislation will promote this kind of thinking, this kind of behavior, because anyway, laws are intended to change behavior. So putting it in a positive light, giving people incentive on how to push forward this concept or practices of uh, uh, rights of nature. So yeah, so we, but of course, that, like I've said, it will require also uh, tremendous resources from the lo from local governments because they need to do technical study, which at certain point in the Philippines, the local government units are classified based on the resources that they have. So if they don't have money to, to, to hire a scientist or consultant, it's not in their appropriation. They cannot do that. So they will rely more on NGOs and organizations like PMPI to do this kind of work. So there, right. there are challenges also, but at the same time, there's, there's a space there that we can really uh, uh, push to the limits. Thank you very, very much. That's, that's a really... It's a very good response in terms of everything that those of us working at multiple levels need to consider. The lack of conflict between the local and the national legislation, but also how they differ and what does that mean um, in terms of implementation and enforcement. So thank you very much for that. I think the last question that we have time for um, is, um, Yolanda, I'll ask you, I believe it's called the White Sand Project in Manila Bay. Uh, if I've said that correctly, and if PMPI has a position on that, you're smiling, so I'm guessing the answer is yes. Can you speak briefly about that? Yes. Actually, uh, we just had a meeting with uh, Attorney Maki and uh, four other lawyers, Attorney Pebinito, on this. And uh, we have decided, uh, Maki can add, uh, that uh, we will file uh, a case 
at the Supreme Court and also in the municipal uh, level. It's now in the process uh, of uh, writing no? uh, these petitions and these uh, letters so that uh, we can we can stop uh, the, the uh, dumping. So of course, we believe that this dumping is will only destroy the ecosystem in the in the in the bay and uh will not even the, the perspective of beautification will ultimately be uh empty you no know, because they say that the the waves actually in that area are so strong that later on it can just be washed away you no know? they wanted the white sand in that uh, area for purposes of uh, looking at it beautifully. <laughs> so Attorney Maki is actually preparing uh, the, the, the documents uh, on this. Attorney Maki, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, Br briefly, uh, ju just a, a background on this. There, there's already a case filed at the Supreme Court asking all the local governments within Manila Bay. And when you say Manila Bay, this, uh, this is composed of several municipalities, cities around that. And they are compelled by a decision to clean up, re rehabilitate Manila Bay. And that's where we will come in and we will intervene uh, to, to, to compel again this, this local government, government units not to do reclamation, but instead implement the rehabilitation that was originally uh, decided by the Supreme Court that they do this in a certain way. There's a program to it, and, this, and there's a committee within the Supreme Court that is monitoring all the works that the EDU should do in this regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you both so much. Um, I just want everyone just to thank um, Yolanda Esguera and Attorney Mackey. This has just been a tremendous presentation. Your depth of knowledge and your advocacy is just really stunning, and we deeply appreciate your work and our partnership with you both. Um, I know that there probably are other questions and we consider this the beginning of a conversation. So if people are listening and watching, um, we can certainly um, help get answers to those um, in the future if you have them after the webinar tonight. Um, so a big, big thank you to you both. Um, and we just want to remind everybody that this webinar recording will be, we'll place it up on uh, YouTube, we'll have it on our website, and you'll be able to find it in other places. So um, you'll be able to share it with others and watch again if you want more, um, to see more. Um, and I also want to remind everybody that there are more resources out there um, regarding the rights of nature, the human right to a healthy environment, the Global Forum event that I mentioned on October 1st and 2nd. There's information on how to register. It's free. Um, very, very strong advocates um, will be um, presenting there too. You can find that information on our website, the Center for Environmental Rights.org. Um, so we welcome everybody to join us and to sign up for our updates so that you can find these kinds of events, um, rights of nature, webinars, and other kinds of trainings and workshops. We welcome all of you um, to join us. And lastly, just again, Many, many thanks to Yolanda and Attorney Mackey for just such an excellent presentation. We deeply, deeply appreciate your work and for everybody for joining us. Thank you and have a good evening and a good morning. Good morning and thank you also. Bye. Bye.